so we want to first of all to welcome all of you uh, in the Yeshiva University office in Jerusalem to meet a legendary person, Rabbi Aaron Raketer, who I met in Moscow in 1980. Uh, when uh, the Mossad got in touch with me in May of 1980, I got a very strange call. I jumped for the phone because my father was very ill at the time. He subsequently died that year. And I thought it was the hospital calling. And a lady gets on from Tel Aviv and she says, Haravra Kefet, Atamuchan le Kabel Sicha, Beli le Galotat Pratea Sicha. Translation Are you willing to accept the call, but you can't tell anyone about the call? I figured for sure it's one of my students calling who's doing a terrible sin, and I've gotten calls like that. And they think I'm a Catholic priest, that I can tell them to say some Hail Marys and they're forgiven. So I figured that's the story. I just got in a call. I don't even want to repeat the Shiler. It involves a sex, deviant sexual behavior. So I said, the Vakasha passed the phone on, and uh, a man gets on. And he says, We know that you know how to teach Gemara. Are you willing to teach Gemara in Moscow? And I answered yes. He said, Who will you take with you? I said, My wife. And then he says to me, And what about your three daughters? And he gives me their names and their ages. I mean, I was shaking. Of course, in retrospect, I realized the Mossad had done a thorough check on me uh, to see, number one, that they could depend upon me, that I'm a loyal citizen. And I did have that American passport and that dual identity that uh, I could pass for a real American. In other words, it's not, not enough. I, later, in, later, when I worked with the next 10 years, Malkin and I worked for the Mossad. We sent over 200 people to Russia, our shlich, shlichim, we called them, our emissaries, uh, so-called tourist quotation marks. And um, each, each one who went did wonderful, wonderful work. But um, all this could only come about because Aryeh Kroll, who was the person who spoke with me, later gets Pras Yisrael for uh, evolving this whole scheme, we can call it, realizing our dual identity. So when I would look for people, I had to look for people who had an American passport, a Canadian passport. Uh, that was most important, but it was more than that. You could be born in America or Canada, but you're not really an American or a Canadian. You speak uh, the language with a bit of an accent. Uh, you, you don't know baseball, for instance. And... Uh, we had the advantage that we, what I call Chatsi Evet, Chatsi Ben Koren, we were half Israeli, half Americans. And that began a tremendous saga in my life that continues until today. Um, after the Holocaust, I know what happened in America, and uh, I'm only alive, by the way, because of the Russo Japanese War. I write about it in my seventh book, let's say, scholarly memoir, the seventh book. And uh, in that book, I write about my grandfather, who was very lonely in America and had saved up enough money and booked passage to go back 1904. And about a week before he was to sail, he got a telegram from his parents not to come back. Funya, meaning the Tsar, is looking for you for the Russian army. That was the Russo-Japanese War. And when he heard about the army, he remained in America. And as they say, then he married, and the rest is history. So, uh, you know, I saw what happened in America, how my spiritual life was saved because of a Japanese consul named Sempo Sugihara, Seichat Tzadik Levracha. He served, saved the Mir Yeshiva via Japan, the well-known story. And uh, in 1948, 47, they arrived in America, in Palestine. They had to find jobs for them. And by 48, uh, they were teaching 49 in, in a day school, what you would call a day school today. I was going to Yeshiva Rabbi Israel Salantum in the Bronx. 
And suddenly in seventh grade, I had a Rebbe that didn't speak a word of English and I didn't speak a word of Yiddish. A year later, I had Rabbi Hanich Fishman, Talmud Muvhak of the Brisk of Rav. And Rabbi Hanich had a great influence. And it's amazing what happened as a result of these refugees in the United States. And then we always knew Russian Jewry was persecuted. Rabbanim were executed. Malamdim were exiled to Siberia. What could we do? And suddenly there was the chance to really accomplish and really do. And subsequently, 40, 40, more than 40 years later, you look back and you see the rebirth and you see so many Balei Tshuva. And I wouldn't even call them Balei Tshuva. I can be a Balei Tshuva if I did something wrong. But these people knew nothing. They discovered the blood in their veins. They discovered who they are. I want to tell Rabbi Katzin a little story that um, a few years ago, uh, my granddaughter was doing Sherit Lumi in Tel Aviv. She was a guide to certain museums there. And the Sarona, what they rebuilt, if you're familiar with that project in the heart of Tel Aviv. And uh, we wanted to eat out uh, before we went to the second museum where she was guiding. And uh, she told us, yeah, there's this nice kosher vegan. It's a vegan place. So we go there, and uh, about, and we're sitting outside. We ordered the food. It was a nice day. We're sitting outside. We're eating. And about two rows behind us, two young men in their 30s are learning Mishnah Brura and talking in Russian. And it was, to me, like the sweetest music in the world that I could hear them learning Mishnah Brura and talking in Russian. I then went over to them and I told them, do you know where you are? Do you know where you're sitting? And I think they figured, ah, Nutnik, what's he bothering us? But I then mentioned Shvutami, that I was one of the founders and they're, ah, for Rav Kugel, you know this one, you know that one? Ah, then they were willing to listen and I told them that Sarona Park, they knocked out Albert Mendel Street. Albert Mendel Street 24 was the most secret part of the whole Russian operation in Israel. I was then in the army. I had done basic at the age of 38 and 76. And for the next 15 years, I was in the uh, Didmiluim. And the heart of my Miluim was in the Central Army base in Tel Aviv. To get into the Central Army base, what's called the Matek Klali, all I did was have to show one piece of paper I was in. To get into the Russian place, the secret place, which was a few blocks away, I would go there from the army to the Russian place, meet with I.A. Crow. Had to go through three levels of security. Do you know why? Because in the final building where I met with Aye, they had one of the earliest computers in Israel. It was an entire wall. It was a big, large room, lights flashing. And they had the name of every refusenik, anyone who requested repatriation out of Russia was in that computer. And I'll say about the Mossad, this was a branch of the Mossad. It was called Nativ. And it dealt expressively only with Russian Jewry. They were the ones, Arye Crow headed up the division that dealt with people like myself and my wife that had dual identity and were being used as shluchim to Russia. And what the Mossad did, when you requested to leave, so someone snuck it out of Russia, one of the visitors, and it reached the hands of Nativ, of this branch of the Mossad. And uh, they have your name, it goes into the computer. Well, now they have to find a relative. So they check the Israeli population uh, computer. If they had a computer, then it might have only been a list, but it was all there. They would get someone with your name and they would invite you to come to Israel and claim they're a first cousin, they're a brother, they're a nephew. 
Now, you should know the Mossad never told these people. But one time they came up with a relative, created this, sent the visa request, and suddenly I get a call. People are hysterical. What happened was the person in Russia who got the invitation was a smart Russian Jew. He uncovered the phone number who this person was inviting him, and he called to find out who his long last artificial cousin, nephew, uncle was. And that person was so shaken up, communist Russia is calling him. So the Anglo said, uh, go, go to Rabbi Rakefet. He knows what's going on. So I would tell them, relax, forget about it. It doesn't concern you. It's not going to harm you. It's only going to work to the advantage of Kalal Yisrael. All right, these are just a few reflections. There's a world more, and uh, it's the miracle of rebirth. Uh, if anyone would have told me uh, after World War II that Torah would thrive again, uh, I would have looked at them quixotically. But today, in my old age, I sit in my office in Jerusalem, and I want you to know that this campus I'm the one that got it for Yeshiva University. I always say I gave YU a hundred million dollar gift, if you know what this campus is and what it's worth today. And that's a story unto itself, how I got it and created, helped create the Kolil here. And uh, I look at my own family, Baruch Hashem. When all is said and done, I have to be honest with Arye. We've done this for Yiddishkeit, we've done this, I've spoken, I've given shirim all over the world, South Africa, Australia. New York. All over America, forget about New York, Canada. Uh, oh, I've been all over the world. But um, those achievements are wonderful. My scholarship, my books, etc., my shayurim, my wonderful students. But the greatest achievement is your own family, that uh, you raise uh, children, uh, grandchildren, now great-grandchildren, and the nachat I have to see them walk in the paths of their great-great-great-great-grandparents. They continue the Hemshech Yud, the Mesorah, the continuity, and uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't be ashamed and to meet a vot shalanu, ha'ima ad shalanu, avracham, Yaakov, Sarah Rivka, Rachel, Valeya, and to meet Mashiach Tzidkenu, Bimheira, Biyameinu, Amen, Sela. Rabbi Rakefet, thank you so much. I just want to mention something, that when I came to Israel, the first day right. I came here, right. the first day, right. Right. and I think at that day, not only that I had the privilege to address the students of Yeshiva University, but also I saw somebody who was, I believe, one of your shlichim, by the name Tzvi. Tzvi Grona. Tzvi Grona. Tzvi Grona Levracha. I didn't know that Baruch Dayan met, but I heard what he said to me then. He said, when I came to Russia, it suddenly uh, made clear to me that the miracle of rebirth of Russian Jewry is greater than the next Hanukkah, than the miracle of Hanukkah. Remember what he said? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Because he said, in Hanukkah, Jews defeated Greeks and Mityavnim, and the, so to speak, kapos, Jewish kapos, the Mityavnim. How would you translate the word Mityavnim? Uh, uh, Hellenist Jews. Uh, assimilated Jews. No, not only assimilated. They were Hellenist Jews Hellenist who fought Jews. together with yeah, Greeks right. against the right. Jews. Against the, the, the Torah and Mitzvot and Shabbat. And so Kasha. he said, when I came to Moscow Shul, I saw the grandchild of Yakir. Yakir one, 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 was one of the leaders of the communist revolution. And his grandchild became a Baal Tshuva. Right. And later on, he was a prisoner of Zion. So he said, I saw the Hellenist Jews themselves. Came it's like darkness became light. light. It was not just the victory of light over darkness, but God. the darkness itself turned around so, to so, become light. So I want to tell you, Leon Trotsky's yes. grandson is a Yira Tzadik. Uh, he, 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 he was in Kiryat Arba. You know him. Right, I know right, him. Right. I know him. Born, Bernstein, the right. original name. Right. So we, we actually witnessed well, it. No, we, 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 we've seen a rebirth that is second to none. We have a lot more to do. 
Oh. But uh, be and, a, and then another nachas I want to give you is Sarona. Today in Sarona, we have a Russian shul of Rabbi Yosef Hersonsky. Uh -huh. Not just a shul, one of the villas rented by 700 people who donated to his project. And there is a huge movement of young Russian Jews coming to him to learn. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. And my blessing to us that we should have rage programs together with him and Sarona. And I'm inviting you for the first class in Sarona, which will be in Mirza Hashem soon, of this program of Tel Aviv University students and people that live there and they have no yet connection to the Jewish life, they will come to Sarona and that will be a secret place to restart a new stage of rebirth of Russian Jewry in Israel. Ah. Beautiful, beautiful. Sharona, by the way, it was developed by uh, the Israeli government now. It was, um, there were houses there, old houses, like, as I mentioned, the house that housed Nativ. They were all knocked down, and there's a big park. What, what's amazing there is, that's where they put together the planes. Planes were smuggled in part by part from Czechoslovakia, and other places in Europe after World War II. And so the British shouldn't see, they worked underground in what today is the Serona Park. Uh, it's a museum, it's very, very fascinating. On a lighter side, there's a, I don't know what to call it, a cafe, a saloon. It has maybe 500 different whiskeys all kasher, it's under hashkacha, and that's also in Sarona. So you have the best of the to past work. and the present. And the future. And, and the future. You have a Russian show. show. Russian show. Russian show right there. Kanain Hara. It's, uh, it's amazing. I, we're, we're in Israel, my wife, myself, our children. We're in Israel 53 years, and uh, at times we're just overwhelmed uh, by the miracles that have happened here. You know, you hear all the difficulties, and there are difficulties, and people are people. Some of the news is very disappointing. The scandals we've had in, in the Torah world, which uh, just shocking. But uh, forget about all the downtrodden news. Look at the good, look at the positive, look at the achievement, look at the youth, look at the army, look at the high tech, and I have to tell you, a lot of from people are involved on the highest level, both in the armies had a breakthrough and it continues, uh, we'll know it's totally successful when the chief of staff wears a kippah and sits it, we know we've really achieved. You take high tech, day after day, all farming will end in Israel, it doesn't pay to export uh, cucumbers, but wow, I just read today, another high-tech Israeli idea, billions of dollars coming into the country week after week. And the chinam in kesev, it's pure profit. So Baruch Hashem, the day has come when they're collecting funds here for Torah education in the United States and not vice versa. Ashrenu shezachinu. And Jews are Jews. Again, it's not perfect. You see with the Jewish agency trying to select a new head of the agency. It's a lot worse than Trump versus Biden. And But nevertheless, <laughs> Baruch Hashem, Am Yisrael Chai. And that's all uh, Davinu Chai, Am Yisrael Chai. By the way, I have to say about Shlomo Lekalbach that that song was ingenious because it's Am Yisrael Chai, but all Davinu Chai, that it's not enough to be Am Yisrael. You have to continue the traditions of your father, of your mother, the traditions of Sinai. So he was a genius. I knew Shlomo quite well. He was a genius on that level. Am Yisrael Chai? Old of me, Nuchai. Uh, Robert, if, last question. Yeah. We want to learn from you courage. Because I'm sure that when Ari Kroll, who I knew also had the privilege to know, called you and asked you, are you willing to go to Russia? You understood that communist Russia <laughs> is not a joke. Uh, yeah. And they can arrest you and they can, who knows what they can do. And I remember when you came and you spoke at my apartment in Moscow, uh, and you learned Gemara, we learned Gemara Psochim with Sochem, you. We learned Gemara Psochim. And, and we learned about the Seder. 
and we learned beautiful things about halacha, how to put fill in in the morning when it's still dark. I remember beautiful things. But one thing you shared with us, and you said that an Arab Palestinian came to you in a Moscow airport right. and asked you, are you Jewish? Right, right. And you were scared what he's going to do to you. You're, you're in your new country, you don't know this place. And um, I have to admit, when I come to Russia today, I still have some uncomfortable feelings really? until today. Right. It's a different country, no KGB, right? But I still feel today, I don't know how you did then. So my question for you, and you, what did you answer? Remember what you answered? Uh, uh, I told them, no, I said I'm Jewish. You said I, you're absolutely. Jewish. I, and you explained why. Uh, you could say I'm an American, like right, go away. Right, why right, you, why right, are you asking? Right. You I'm said even, deny, under, even under the threat of dying. I'm not going to deny that I'm, I'm not going to deny my Jewishness right, because right. these are the things we're willing right, to right, die for. Right. And, and if you don't know what to die for, you don't know what to live, live for. for. Right. So my question is, what gave you power, courage, to go to Russia, and not just once, but many times, and send 200 teachers into a lion's mouth. Right. How right. did you do it? All right. The, the, the answer is basically you have to know my wife. Uh, no man accomplishes anything if his wife is not with him. Uh, Malka should live and be well. Uh, very unique individual. I met her in Bnei Akiva. I was teaching already at the age of 17. I was in Madrid. I was teaching, and she was gossiping with her a friend. And I shot at her, where am I up to? What's the place in Pirkei Avot? And she shot back to me, At that moment, I said, this is the lady I'm going to marry. It took me a few years, but we got there. So she's a lady of courage, and I'll tell you what happened. Two students of mine were sent by I.A. Crow from the United States in the late 70s. And before they went into Russia, they came to my house and like it was a final vidui. They left valuable things with us and what to do in case they never come back. And uh, these two students, one are very famous people today. One is Dr. Phil Kaslow of Columbia Presbyterian. One is Rabbi Dr. Danny Rothenberg, a well-known psychologist on the Upper West Side. And uh, Malka said to me, you see, your students have guts. You wouldn't have the guts to go. So when Arye Kroll said to me, Atamu Moskova, I immediately said, oh boy, I'm going to teach my wife a lesson. And when she came home, I said, guess where we're going to have a meeting and guess what it's about? And uh, she couldn't believe it, but she was all with me 100%. Um, I think part of it was after living in Israel, serving the Israeli army and uh, all that goes with it, um, and seeing Israel and, and seeing the country and getting to understand a country built by DPs, by survivors, by uh, masses from the Arab countries, the Edot HaMizrach, and, and from all these people, many of them broken uh, physically, some of them spiritually, look at the country we put together and, and look how life here has improved on all levels, spiritually, physically. It's uh, a nice from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Well, if that's the case, and knowing what Torah is about, that we're not just individuals, we're, we live as, on two levels, we live as individuals, but we live as part of Am Yisrael, Klal Yisrael, Adat Yisrael. We bring a carbon Pesach together with the masses. Look at the Mishnah, you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, when it comes to helping your fellow Jew, absolutely, you have to do what you can. We couldn't help them in the Warsaw Ghetto, but at least we were able to help in Moscow and Leningrad and Minsk and Riga and Vilna. Those were the cities that Malka and I were in uh, Moscow and, and Leningrad quite a few times, and the other cities, each time we were there, there was an additional city which we went to. And I think that's the secret of our success. I might add that one of the great shluchim that I sent was Avram Abba Weingart, Rabbi Dakta. Uh, he was a Talmud Mufak of the Sri Deyesh after World War II. His father was a Talmud Mufak before World War II. And when I asked Avram Abba to go, he went to Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Orbach and asked him, should he go? 
and Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Rohrbach told them to ask me what's the worst that has happened to our Shluchim. So I told him a few were beaten up by a hooliganim, quote, end quote, KGB agents on the street. By the way, the word hooliganim is a word they use in Russia. It's a word I learned in Yiddish as well, hooligans. Uh, that was the worst. David Applebaum, Hashem Yekom Domo, Rabbi Dr. David Applebaum, whose picture is right behind me on the wall, um, he was actually arrested. He was in jail. I write about it. He was murdered by the terrorist uh, terror, attack. Yeah, he, was, terrorist he attack, and his wife. And, and the, night, the night before her wedding, she had just gone to mikvah. To the, to Nava. She was sitting with his daughter, daughter in, 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 in the in cafe. Rechavi, in, in Rechavi. Uh, not, not Rechavi. It was the name of Rafaim in the cafe in Amik Rafaim. They were having coffee and cake the night before her wedding. She had just gone to mikvah. Oh, the price we have paid, that's also... Not to be forgotten here, it wasn't all roses and honey, to put it mildly. And uh, David uh, was actually arrested. I write about it in Washington. I write about it in Rakafet Aram Chelik Dalid. You can see all the information there about David. But uh, they didn't harm him physically. And ultimately, because of the American passport, they let him go. So Rabbi Avram Abba got back to Rabbi Sh Sh Shlomo Zalman Orbach, and he passed in, well, if that's the worst, the Jew has to be prepared to sacrifice for his people, and he encouraged Avram Abba to go. And the rest is history. Avram Abba went back after communism fell. He went back every year to Leningrad and taught there. They established the university as students there. It turned into a very long-term, intensive relationship with Am Yisrael in Russia. Many of them later came to Israel and they become part of the Israeli scene here, the country built by immigrants from so many different countries, so many different languages, so many different mentalities. But I'll tell you, our great-grandchildren already, uh, they're happy to be here. They, I don't know if they can even start to understand what came before them. And I remember at the Pigeon Hub Men of one of my great-grandsons, I was speaking and talking about it. turned out the grandmother on the other side was my student in Israeli Michala in 72, I believe. Her grandfather, her father, was the Svadik, the Moroccan chief rabbi of Arakiva, Araf Kohen. And I spoke about this little kid, all the different blood in his veins. I spoke where this grandparent is from and that grandparent. Oh, the kid, German, Polish, Russian, Lithuanian, Czechoslovakian, Moroccan. And I don't think the level of my grandchildren even started to understand me. Said, what is he talking about? We're all Israelis uh, and, and Baruch Hashem. Ashrenu Shezachinu, that they say we're all Israelis. It's a fabulous achievement. Lekavod uleteferet ulahagdil Torah ulahadira. I want to thank Rabbi Rakefet for this amazing interview and give a blessing. Mm -hmm. And the blessing is that Rabbi Rakefet, we need you and Malka for many, many years and decades to come, because Klal Israel Jewish people need you. We, and we need you healthy and strong. Continue to give you Monday, Tuesday classes, writing your wonderful sporim. And I have to say that in my shul in Brooklyn, your books on the shelf, and my children, even the oldest boy, Ab Abromi, who's an attorney right now in, in Israel, used to come to this shul and take your book, and he knows uh, all about your books. And my one of my youngest children, David, it's my Who, Talmud. David Michal, he's became your Talmud. Right, he right. He comes here on classes and he's so inspired. And my blessing to you, I see there is a picture on the wall that I want to show this picture. This picture of you with whom? It's my first great-grandson. Great-grandson. going to be by Mitzvah this spring. And it says on it, Ilan, Ilan, Bema Avarachecha, tree, tree. What should I bless you with? And there is an answer. And what's the biggest blessing we can give to a tree and the biggest blessing we can give to you? That all the other Netiyat, all the other trees, all the other descendants should be like you. So, so, so my, my blessing to you that 
all your children and grandchildren and great grandchildren, generations to come, and all your students, and I'm one of them. Right, right. And all our students, also generations to come, be like you Amen. with tremendous avat Israel, with tremendous Amen. love for the Jewish people, and the willingness to sacrifice yourself and go and share your love and wisdom with others. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much.